Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Powell. I didn't think I'd be up here so early in the morning until I was provoked by my hand colleagues earlier this morning. Uh, doing foot and ankle, we do hold up the entire rest of the body. Okay, FYI, <laughs> macho. So my talk today, in all seriousness, is on Achilles tendon ruptures. Uh, I have no disclosures. So Achilles tendon ruptures are quite the common injury um, that I've seen, and they happen a lot in recreational athletes or athletes at all levels. We see them on the paddle courts here, um, a lot of times tennis, squash, basketball as well. We see them at a high level on national TV when, uh, you know, when Kevin Durant tears his Achilles in the 2019 NBA Finals with a three-peat on the line. Um, there are certain risk factors that we know that predispose someone to tear an Achilles tendon, whether it's a history of tendonitis or degeneration or stiffness. Um, there is an increased or, uh, incidence of acute rupture being that we're just being more active and getting out. Um, there is a long-standing debate over the optimal treatment, so much so that at the 2011 American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery meeting, there was a shouting match uh, regarding this injury and the best management of it. And the classic mechanism is when um, someone plants, there's a hyperdorsiflexion injury with the knee extended. The patient always tells me that typically they, you know, they turn back. They, feel, you know, they think someone kicked them in the back of the leg. They think someone threw a ball and hit them in the back of the leg. And when they turn back, no one's there. And then when the adrenaline wears off, then they kind of go down. Um, but the Achilles tendon is the strongest tendon. It's the largest and strongest tendon in the body. And, um, and this is what happens. So treatment, uh, as we're going to get to today, depends on the patient, to put it simply. Uh, so outside the scope of this talk, just a disclaimer here that um, this is on acute rupture, so chronic ruptures, you know, four to six weeks out at least are not covered as part of this talk. Uh, higher rupture, so like the myotendinous junction rupture, uh, totally different entity, typically can be treated non-surgically. And then when we talk about tendinopathy, whether it's insertional or non-insertional, that is a totally different um, uh, topic as well. So. Evaluation, getting the patient in front of you and being able to, to do a good uh, physical exam. I cannot speak to the importance of this. So there's three main things that I typically emphasize that will keep you out of trouble and that you'll almost never miss an Achilles tendon rupture with these three things. So on physical exam, you can typically, there's a palpable gap uh, in the mid substance of the Achilles. When you run your finger over the Achilles tendon, there's a divot and it tends to just kind of um, slide down and then you can feel that gap in the Achilles tendon. The other thing is the Thompson test is we, as most of us probably know, when you get the patient prone, you uh, squeeze the calf. There's no observed ankle plantar flexion on calf squeeze. And what that implies is that there's a loss of continuity between the calf, the Achilles and the rest of the foot. The third thing I think is a little less talked about, but I think is quite important on exam as well. It's called the Maddell sign, and it's looking at the tension. So when you get the patient prone, you flex their knee to 90 degrees, and you look at the resting tension of the ankle. In this picture on the left here, um, the, so the ankle, uh, the far ankle, which is the right side because this patient is prone, you can see that the ankles or the toes are still flexing somewhat up, and then the left um, ankle is just drooping, it's flexing down. And that's quite evident a lot of times on exam when you see an acute Achilles tendon rupture. That's the benefit about um, comparing it to the contralateral side. These three things you'll almost never miss a rupture in clinic. Uh, as part of the workup, besides the exam, I typically will get a lateral x-ray, um, typically just to rule out an avulsion of the calcaneus. If you want to get really fancy sometimes, you can also see a loss of continuity of what's called Kager's triangle. So this triangle here, which I'll try to point out. So it's a soft tissue triangle in the very back that you can see on the lateral. It's not always super accurate, but the anterior, the front of the triangle is the border of the FHR, or the flexor hallucis longus tendon. The back of the triangle is the contour of the Achilles and then the inferior part of the triangle is the top of the, or the superior aspect of the calcaneus. A lot of times, and I didn't um, put it in this lecture, you will see a disruption in that triangle when you, uh, with an Achilles tendon rupture. Um, MRI, I get this question all the time, do we always need to get an MRI to confirm? Most of the time on physical exam, you can make the diagnosis right then and there and then decide what to do. 
I will get an MRI in certain situations where the diagnosis is equivocal, whether you know it's on exam, they have decent tension, there's a gap, but I'm not sure if it's a partial rupture, which is uncommon, but I have seen it before. Uh, if you're worried about a mild tendinous junction injury that's tr that can be treated non-surgically, uh, I typically get an MRI as well. And then in chronic situations where you're worried about the gap or how retracted the ends of the tendon edges are, you typically get an MRI as well. So treatment options, we're talking about surgery, whether to operate on it or whether to treat it conservatively, which involves something called functional rehab, which we'll get to in a sec. The picture on the right side is an acute Achilles tendon uh, rupture I saw in early March of this year. So you can see the approximate gap about 4.3 uh, centimeters here. And you see that loss of continuity in the Achilles tendon in this um, sagittal cut on the MRI. So this is, you know, getting into non-op treatment, this is one of the landmark papers that came out, JBGS 2010, Kevin Willits out of Canada. And it was a randomized control trial um, that compared operative and non-operative treatment. I think there were about just under 150 patients total. They took functional outcomes and they showed that um, equivalence in the functional outcomes between operative and non-operative treatments. Although there are definitely some caveats, which I'll get into, they did compare non-operative treatment and the way they did surgery um, in that study was an open incision. Um, so, you know, multiple other studies have borne out in the literature that show the equivalence of the uh, functional outcomes with operative and non-operative treatment. However, there has been shown quite consistently to be an increased re-rupture rate up to just shy of 10% with non-operative treatment. This is significantly decreased with surgery, whether it's open, percutaneous, minimally invasive, which we'll also get into, uh, with more soft tissue complications, obviously, uh, from the surgery. So what types of soft tissue complications are there? Why do we have soft tissue complications with Achilles tendon surgery? Is because of the way it is. So the Achilles tendon, you can all you know reach on the back of your heels and feel your Achilles tendon because it is very, very superficial. It is literally right under the skin. The blood supply to the area of the heel, as we have uh, learned from our angiosome studies to assess the vascular supply, is very, very poor. And it's a very, very fragile um, uh, vascularity to that region of the body. Um, my other joint partners or other partners in orthopedics, I'm very jealous because they don't have to worry about uh, soft tissue, um, you know, risks like that. And this is a reason not to fix Achilles tendon uh, ruptures. This is an open incision. This is actually my complication from April of 2020. Long incision to hist, multiple washouts, had to get plastic surgery on board lost five years off my life stressing out about this, but you know, at the end of the day, it is an absolute nightmare to deal with Achilles tendon infections after this type of surgery with a long open incision. And it does happen. And then when you talk about trying to take him back for repeat operations, then you have to remove all the non-resorbable suture. You're compromising the integrity. Depending on the timetable to when the infection occurs, then the Achilles tendon may not be healed yet. And then you've really, um, really caused a big complication uh, to occur in the situation there. And then you have to talk about soft tissue coverage. If there's a defect in the skin, whether you have to get plastic surgery on board, whether you may have to consider a flap down the road um, to get rid of the infection, all just really, really stressful to deal with. So non-operative treatment, functional rehab, there are a bunch of different protocols that are out there in terms of how to how to rehab someone non-operatively. It's not just, oh, let's put you in a boot and, and, then, um, and then treat this non-operatively. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to get this to heal even if you don't do surgery. But at the end of the day though, it's a brief period of immobilization for about two to three weeks non-weight bearing. I typically try to plantar flex them in a cast for the first two, three weeks just to let everything heal. The idea behind putting the ankle in plantar flexion is to bring the two edges of the tendon together as you can imagine, if you dorsiflex, then the edges are um, start to go farther apart. Uh, the key to functional rehab is to avoid overstretching the tendon and to avoid over vigorous therapy. So it's a lot of coordination between the surgeon. Again, it's not just me. It's you know I think the therapists are quite critical um, in Achilles tendon injuries because they honestly see the patient more. I may see the patient you know every couple weeks, and then I space it out to every couple months as time goes on, and I see improvement but it's the therapists that are seeing this patient you know, two, three times a week, constantly checking in, getting the range of motion measurements and seeing just how this patient is doing 
on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, obviously, there's a risk of re ruptures. We talked about with non-operative treatment. The key is also to catch this injury early. So, you know, based on the inclusion criteria of a lot of different studies, I think the ideal time frame is between the first two to seven days after the injury to catch this injury and also to make sure that the patient has had minimal weight bearing in that time period. It's really hard to look at a patient who's gone two weeks in a boot, been walking on it with a mid substance Achilles tendon rupture, and just to apply the studies and say, oh, you know, you're going to do just fine with non operative treatment because the outcomes are the same. You really can't apply it in that situation because, you know, the farther and farther you, you go out, then the tendon edges start to um, go farther apart. It starts to scar. I've seen patients who have come in five weeks after rupture. They just didn't know. And it happens sometimes. I, I saw a patient a couple months ago who was over two months out and just honestly didn't know. And it's, it's, it's commonly missed. That's why the exam is important. And some people just think they sprain their ankle, they limp a lot, and then as time goes on, it tends to get better, but they walk with a noticeable limp and then they come in. So what are the benefits of trying to get this fixed? So the reason why you do surgery is to restore the tension. The gastrosoleus Achilles complex, three calf muscles, two gastroc and the soleus, they condense to form the Achilles. It's a very, very tight spring. It gives us that power to do all the things we want to do as humans. Um, you, so you regain that tension, you regain the plantar flexion weakness, the literature has shown us that return to work time is a little quicker with operative treatment by about 19 days, so almost three weeks. Um, calf strength recovery is a little faster as well. And a lot of times up to 50% of defects are not compensated just by putting the ankle in max plantar flexion. So even though you maximally plantar flex the ankle, a lot of times the edges of the rupture are actually not opposing and there's still somewhat of a gap, even if you catch it early. So more about surgery. There's different surgical techniques. We'll talk about open and minimally invasive. Open, you know, so regardless of the surgical technique, what are we doing here? So we're putting sutures in the tendon. So sutures protect the tendon, they strengthen the repair, they prevent over elongation of the tendon, and they try to prevent re-rupture. And whether it's open or minimally invasive, that's essentially uh, the surgery. And this diagram on the bottom, there's a million different ways, there's a million different techniques of um, triple bundle, gift box, loop, um, crack out sutures, different techniques to repair the tendon and to get the best um, uh, apposition of the tendon ends. Um, this picture on the top makes me cringe for multiple reasons because A, it's an open incision. B, as you can see, there's two retractors at the very top of the screen pulling even more tension on an already fragile area. So even with open repairs, when I, you know, when I used to do them, I had no retraction because a lot of times in open repairs, the skin just opens up enough that you don't need any retraction to see what you need to do. So all this stuff combined together leads to increased risk of these soft tissue complications with open surgery. So going to the minimally invasive technique, um, this is a jig that's placed through a two to three centimeter incision percutaneously. And the jig, the inner tines of the jig are able to capture the two stumps of the tendon rupture. And then on the side of the jig here, as you can see on the upper right hand uh, of the screen with these numbers, you throw these needles through the jig and looped and attached on the needles are these sutures. So with the needles, you percutaneously place these sutures through the tendon. You then pull the jig out and, and, and create a locking stitch or multiple locking stitches depending on the technique in the tendon and then all done through a very, very small incision. And it's such a big difference going from eight to 10 centimeter incision, high risk of infection to two, three centimeters, going to heal just fine. I know in the technique guide for this, of which I can't say the, you know, the company, they always prefer the transverse incision. And I think different surgeons differ in terms of wh you know, whether they prefer a transverse incision or a vertical incision. And my personal bias is to do a vertical incision for this because if you have to bail, because this does not always work. You can always just extend the incision up or down and cosmetically, it's much less of a nightmare to close. A lot of times in a transverse incision, if you have to extend the incision, whether um, it's because of tissue quality, the sutures are pulling out, you have to Z the incision and it just doesn't look as good. Although I've seen it before, I'm just not a big fan of it. It's much easier just to extend it vertically. Um, so I'd say about, you know, five, 10, you know, small, I'd say about 5% of the time you, I have had to bail to an open procedure. So um, doing this minimally invasive technique, it just, it's not always you know, perfect. Um, 
And then you can also, even after you throw the sutures through the proximal stump, um, you can do the same thing through the distal stump and then tie them, or you can take the sutures through the proximal stump, just like in this picture in the middle, and dock them into the calcaneus with suture anchors in the very back of the calcaneus, as seen in this middle picture, to create a knotless repair. That's honestly just surgeon technique as well. Um, so if we look at the outcomes, we've turned open and minimally invasive. This is one of my colleagues in, at Emory in Atlanta. They took, um, they compared open and minimally invasive, and at the end of the day, open is associated with more ankle stiffness, longer surgical time, and a significantly increased risk of superficial wound infection. So doing minimally invasive, it cuts your surgical time, it cuts the rate of stiffness, and it takes the superficial wound infections from 6% to 0.4%, and that is huge. The more of these you do, if you can have that risk reduction in infection rate, I think it's a game changer. Uh, the thing with minimally invasive that you'll always hear about is sural nerve issues. So it's because you're um, inserting the needles through the jig, it may injure or push the sural nerve. And I have had, you know, there's in this study, they talked about about 3.5% incidence of sural nerve palsies with the minimally invasive uh, repairs. I have had that happen in patients where there's sensitivity in that sural nerve distribution post-operatively. I really haven't had patients complain about that at all, and I'd much rather that at the end of the day versus an infection. Um, so in terms of rehab after the surgery, the number one priority, number one through 10, is wound healing. I used to splint these, um, and now I do short leg casting with the ankle and plantar flexion. Sutures come out about two to three weeks after surgery, and they remain non-weight bearing until the sutures are out. Between weeks three and six, you start to weigh bear in a cam boot with heel wedges, and then you gradually remove the wedges one per week until about the six week mark on average. About the six week mark is when you can start some therapy. Uh, my general rule until the 12 week mark is no passive dorsiflexion past neutral until we get about three months out from the surgery. That's when we're almost out of the woods, so to speak, in terms of a re-rupture. Um, but you know, over vigorous physical therapy too early on can definitely over lengthen the tendon and increase the risk of a possible re-rupture. So in summary, like, um, it's important to assess the patients, talk to them about the options, determine their goals and expectations, and it's an evolution of things. You know, I, I think a lot of my colleagues who you've heard this morning, um, the way they practice is definitely different than when they started, and for me, it's, you know, it's no different. I did, um, I did what I was most comfortable with and what I was trained on. I did open repairs almost exclusively the first two years of my practice, and I've now gone to almost exclusively all, all uh, minimally invasive technique for all the Q10 and ruptures. And uh, it's really been a big game changer in, in lessening the complication risk uh, with surgery. So future directions going forward, how we can improve results even better. Um, talking about biologic augmentations, I think a lot of other surgeons this morning have talked about the role of PRP or stem cells or bone marrow aspirate. There's no routine data in the literature to suggest uh, the use of that right now currently. Uh, we're also looking at ways to potentially um, improve the technique so that you can rehab these patients faster because we know that moving tendons earlier is actually beneficial um, as long as you're confident with the repair. And then taking a closer look at the studies that I talked about before that show that functional outcomes are equivalent because even though a lot of those studies um, show the functional equivalence between operative and non-operative management, there's what's called a fragility index that's now being studied. It looks at, well, um, if you took X number of patients and if they had a different, re or, if they did, or if they had a different result, um, it's actually not statistically significant, and there's some work being done in the foot and ankle literature to assess uh, those studies now. So.